Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Uh, thank you. I would like to start with thanking the organizers who just arrived. So uh, to giving me this opportunity to come here once once more. It's a pleasure. Um, I will not be talking about localization. Uh, so this will be a slight change of gear, I guess, towards topology. But I want to tell you a little bit about these new kind of topologies with non-abelian uh, properties, charges and braiding properties, far from equilibrium, and then the new phases that we have been discovering um, in the inflow case settings, particularly. So, um, yeah, before starting, let me uh, mention my collaborators. So I had the great pleasure of working with several uh, brilliant physicists, uh, theorists, uh, and experimentalists over the, over the years, particularly in light of this uh, talk today, it's worth mentioning Robert, uh, Nigel, and Adrian. And uh, I'm lucky that, that I could just like both like develop these theories on topology and other dynamics, but then we could also take these and then put into experiments, particularly in, in Germany and in, in Cambridge. So, um, and I will also present the work of my student, um, Oli, uh, who just moved to Oxford. So, yeah. So, uh, this is just to give you a feeling of why we are doing uh, what we are doing. Uh, so, the, so, you know that topology is interesting, that like, you know, we have been developing a lot of like classification schemes. There are different invariants, Chern numbers, the two invariants, whatever, tenfold way classification. But when we take, so this is a small uh, sub subset of uh, what, what, uh, of like a couple, couple of years uh, recently. But um, so when we take these ideas to out of equilibrium by doing quenches or under periodic driving, more interesting things happen. And then here the motivation is not only that, like, you know, life is dynamic, things, things are just like interesting uh, out of equilibrium, but all those classification schemes that those have to be extended out of equilibrium. So for example, you can ask that, like you have a churn number. So you have some ground state, churn number is okay, we know. You can suddenly change the Hamiltonian and you can ask like, is there anything topologically protected? while this wave function uh, is evolving. It's your constant, uh, like out of equilibrium completely. But indeed, we just like can just like say that like for different topological classification schemes, there can be topological singularities in the wave function while it's evolving. And then they are moving in the parameter space and in time, and then they can form links. So I will not be explaining going, uh, going down, down those churn numbers, but they can be also experimentally measures, those linking. So there are things topologically protected under these violent quench dynamics, for example. So similarly for periodically driven, driven systems, so we need new classification schemes. So all these considerations allow us to discover new topological invariants and establish new connections between different topological invariants, but also they, uh, they provide a, a convenient and new way of probably exploring these topologies. So today I will be focusing on these uh, new non-abelian multi-gap topologies uh, and then how like uh, the, these band singularities and then what we can do with, do with them. So, um, so just to uh, remind you uh, for the in the conventional single gap topologies, what happens when I go out of equilibrium in the Floquet settings. So uh, thankfully, I don't need to introduce Floquet to this audience, also with the lectures in the, in the past days. But, but you know that when you have like our famous two dimensional electron gas, when we send some laser lights, so instead of uh, bands, so we now have quasi energy bands and like, if normally we can, we could have just like churn number to describe this, this system, but now we need a winding number because if I have two band system, now I have infinitely many replicas and then there could be also topological transitions in between the replicas in these anomalous uh, gap. I can have also edge states here. So the non-topological classification, the bulk edge correspondence that's been famously discovered here in terms of churn numbers breaks down when I have a flow case setting. Instead, I need this ugly looking winding number it's a three-dimensional integral. And I can go ahead and claim that this winding number cannot be observed in its form. You need to measure the, the time evolution operator at throughout a Floquet period, okay? So 
But we know that if we look at also from a little bit of quantum simulations perspective, maybe that if we say that like for these uh, winding numbers, when I have edge states here, I know that topological transition must occur through band touching points, right? The Dirac, Dirac points. So by using that idea and then going to the high frequency regime, like when you have a Floquet setting, so your instinct might be that the low frequency regime or when things are very slowly evolving, that is the equilibrium uh, equivalent or something. But of course, this is not the case for the Floquet setting. Instead, the high frequency regime, we could just like show that this is topologically equivalent to the equilibrium topological classification. Why is that? Because I have these band replicas, Floquet replicas, and in the high frequency regime, these are well separated. So they cannot talk through the Floquet zone edge. And if they cannot talk, there cannot be topological singularities in that gap. And that is how topology changes. So it means that in the high frequency regime, we can say that Chur numbers are enough to describe the topology. And now from that point on, by tuning some parameters in the, the uh, spectrum, we can induce band touching points. And that's how these winding numbers change. And this is like, we can express these winding numbers in terms of the singularities, topological charges, how it can be H. And it, it has been also, uh, uh, successfully implemented in experiment uh, in, in that way. So, so that is the single gap topology. Sure number, when I go to flow case settings, there are these winding numbers, they are interesting. Similar to that Chur number, all other topological classification that we have known so far, like tenfold ways, symmetry-based classifications, topological quantum chemistry, those are single gap topologies. What it means is that when I have, like even I can have many bands, doesn't matter. I have Fermi energy lying somewhere and topological protection in the system is uh, uh, like governed by things happening in that gap, in that Fermi energy gap. If I have many bands filled, I just need to calculate their topological invariance and sum them up. So here, this multi-gap topology earlier class falls beyond uh, like all those classifications because now instead of a single gap, I need multiple gaps. So minimum three bands, I need minimum two gaps. And then the topological protection in this system is, is a result of both of these gaps getting intertwined. So that's why it cannot be captured with symmetry-based like classification schemes. So I need C2T or PT symmetry to enforce a real Hamiltonian. So that's all I need, which is pretty robust. C2 is like quite, quite, quite common. And then uh, the invariant is given by, so when I have topological singularities, band touching points, invariant is given by between some bands, band one and two here, for example, it's given by this non-abelian Berry curvature now. And then interestingly, when I have like band singularity here and a band singularity in an adjacent gap. So normally these two red ones here, they have plus minus charges, so they can annihilate. If I take this band singularity in an adjacent gap, and then move it around this one, braid it around in the brilliant zone, their charges swap from minus, they became plus. So then these two ones here, they cannot annihilate. So this is the non-abelian braiding happening in the, in, in, in the brilliant zone. And this is happening because when I have a real Hamiltonian governed by C2T or PT, so like C2 is taking K to minus K, Time reversal symmetry is taking this back, but also complex conjugates. So if a Hamiltonian has C2T symmetry, it must commute with its complex conjugate, which means that it's real. So its eigenstates are also real. And then if there is a band touching point band singularity here, I cannot find eigenstates reliably. They correspond to a pi flux, similar to the pneumatics there. And importantly, pi one of SON takes values from Z2. So two pi rotations corresponds to minus one you don't come back to yourself. So when I do a braid here, I don't come back to yourself. I need to braid it once more so that I, I get back to the, the charge. Uh, back. So, and, uh, so again, like there could be, if, some kind, if there is some kind of twisting in the, in the Hamiltonian, if I do quench dynamics, this shows up, this picks up, but, but uh, which can be also experimentally observed, but I will be focusing on this, this braiding and then these non-abelian charges uh, today. So, um, so I find that Dirac strings are a nice way 
of visualizing this 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 braiding. So here, this is my CUNY script, and then I will walk through. So if there's a like important slide, this is the most important slide of, of my talk uh, today. So uh, imagine that, uh, like for example, I start with a two-dimensional system, completely trivial. I have three bands. Nothing is happening. Anything. Everything is boring. So by inducing band inversions between band one and two, I can introduce two Dirac cones, like I can create two topological charges. These I will label with triangles. Empty field means that they have opposite charges. So I can just like create them out of vacuum. I, I can create, I need to create them in pairs and then they are connected by a Dirac string. So this Dirac string is, if I want to, so there's a Dirac cone. If I take the eigenstate, if I am trying to fix its gauge, to go around it, I cannot fix it reliably because this Dirac cone has a pi charge, right? So the sign must flip somewhere. So this is this gauge object where that sign flips. So similarly, I can create two more pairs in gap two between them. So they have opposite charges again. So if I have this Euler class, if my Hamiltonian is governed by C to T, so if I take this Dirac cone in gap two and then move it across the Dirac string in the adjacent gap, it's sign flips. So, which means that like, so this, this moving, this Dirac cone, for example, you can do it by straining the system. You can do it with periodic driving. You can do it by, by doing disorder. Even temperature has been shown to do this effect. It's like, I just want to change the Hamiltonian so that my Dirac cones change in, in the Merillion. So then I take this cone, move it across the Dirac string, it's sign changes again. So, which means that now these Dirac cones, if I clash them head on in their gap, they cannot annihilate each other. They have the same charge now. I play this game one more time. I create one more pair. Take this one, move it, it's sign flipped. Take this one, move it, it's sign flipped. So now these uh, circular round ones, they have opposite charges again. So when I combine them together, they will annihilate, leaving these four cones in gap one. And then they have all same charges plus charge which so i mean you cannot create a topological charge uh, for free you need to create them in in pairs right so here so it looks like that i violated some conservation like i just like there are some topological charges and then they are all plus i don't have their negative counterparts but of course i didn't violate anything because this is a setting i can only come through this braiding with the adjacent gap. So that's why I need multiple bands. I need multi-gap multi -gap systems. And this is something I'm allowed to do because when this Hamiltonian is real, so this, the, I have three eigenstates. They are three by one vectors. They can be also found real. So I can treat them as real vectors on SO3. So they form a dry band. And then the pi one charges on this dry band takes values from the quaternion group. So these empty field triangles and circles, they are quaternion charges, i, j, k. And then, so when I take a band node between one and two eigenstate and two and three eigenstate, and then when I move them around, I am twisting this frame around. So this is the Dirac belt trick. So if I do a two pi rotation, I don't come back to myself. I need to braid it once more so that my charges can annihilate again, okay? So if any questions, please interrupt me, uh, okay? So, yes. Excuse me, where? Oh, yes, N Nielsen Dynamia is okay. Because, uh, because again, so Nielsen Dynamia looks at, a, looks in a given gap, right? So that's, that's why like, so usually like when I have a single gap, I have plus or minus chirality it charges. But here, so the, it is okay because this is something that like I'm looking, I need the other gap. I'm really, so these, these are Dirac cones on, on their own, but it's really the full spectrum that is. That is. So, okay, so, let, uh, so now, so you know that like I have some, bands, some band singularities, there are these frame charges, and adjacent gaps are important to do this braiding. That's how I am rotating this uh, dry bind uh, frame. And then when I have a Floquet setting, there is this additional anomalous gap in between the replicas. And I know that there can be singularities that's giving rise to these anomalous Floquet uh, topologies, for example. 
So here, what we are doing is that what happens, can I have some uh, braiding uh, band singularities there, and then can I braid by using them? And then we could answer all these great questions to affirmative. So this is the first, uh, first part of my talk uh, in this sense. So to make things a bit more concrete, I'm going to just like take an example, Kagome lattice, we are familiar with it. And then already in the like static Kagome lattice, there is C2T symmetry, which means that there is an Euler description. And then there is this uh, like KK point, Dirac cones, like, so this is the brilliant zone. So they are connected by a Dirac string, they have pi charges, and then they can annihilate each other. So if I calculate this non-abelian bear curvature around it, it gives zero which measures that, but this quadratic band patching point with the flat band, it has Euler class one, which means that it is formed from two band touching points that have same charges. And this Euler class one measures that, it measures the obstruction against annihilation when they, they combine together. So I'm gonna take this cargo analysis and then I'm gonna shine some light on it. So normally, like when I, if I want some churn, I want to break time reversal symmetry. Here, I don't want to break time reversal symmetry. I want to preserve C2T symmetry. So I'm gonna assume linear polarization or linear shaking of the system. And then without loss of generality, I'm gonna assume just linear uh, shaking along X direction only. So under minimal coupling, this light goes and couples to the momentum. And then I, I, I'm also introducing some sublattice offsets to tune in the parameter. So I have the frequency of the drive, amplitude of the drive, and then two sublattices to tune in the system. The third one, I'm just gauging it, uh, gauging it away. So by using these tuning knobs, I want to change my Hamiltonian and then do this braiding, okay? So, uh, so one uh, now trivial case. So we know that when we, uh, when we have flow case system, we can do dynamical frustration. I think Roderick also showed. Uh, because the tunneling amplitudes get modified with the Bessel function, so I can change the, uh, the sign of my tunnelings, which corresponds to inverting the spectrum, or I can hit the Bessel zeros and then freeze the dynamics in the system. So if I take this Kagome and then I keep increasing my, my shaking amplitude, I'm gonna invert the spectrum and then, but now we know that these have secret frame charges and then we can show that actually this, this Inverting the spectrum dynamical inversion happens via braiding. Like these KK prime points, they behave like gamma points now. Now gamma point became like opposite charges. It happens through braiding. But there are also things that can happen only out of equilibrium, I mean, which means anomalous in this setting. So by tuning some knots, here now I have, I started shaking, shaking my system. The moment I start shaking, this gamma point here, it separates into two because it was protected by the C6 symmetry. I break it now, I choose some direction. So it's separated, it's connected by a Dirac string, but it still has an Euler charge. So I can calculate these spectrums by using the Zuck phases, like along the non-contractible loops. So I know where the Dirac string lies, but I, I don't know how curved they are. They can be anywhere, but I know that they must be, they must be there. So then by tuning these knobs, I just like keep decreasing the sublattice offsets, for example. So these gamma nodes, so they go separate and then they cross a Dirac string of KK prime, their charges, charges flipped, they go annihilate with their pairs, they leave the Dirac string behind. And then uh, thankfully, uh, or uh, luckily, I have these anomalous Dirac strings in between the replicas appearing. They cross two Dirac strings, they still have opposite charges. They look like that they are going to annihilate there, but then they go annihilate in between KK prime. They leave this Dirac string in the anomalous gap, locate gap. So which means that these KK prime points to annihilate, they now need to cross this green Dirac string. So their charges are going to flip, which means that they have Euler class one. Uh, we can also cal calculate this later. So this is an anomalous Euler phase. There are three gaps in the spectrum, something that I cannot have at equilibrium. And then there is a, either some Euler class charge or a Dirac string in every single gap. So a new phase that, can, that I can arrive only via braiding and out of equilibrium. And when, since I have these Dirac string spectrum here, are there observable signatures? Yes. If I take the system and then put it in a finite, uh, finite ribbon, so these Dirac strings, because they don't exist, in atomic limit, they need to project along the edge. And then there are anomalous state states, like smoking gun uh, signatures 
of, of, of this new, new topological phase. By tuning some other parameters, I can again induce this braiding. I can again induce this braiding. And uh, now, uh, so now I'm just like tuning one of the sublattices, for example. Now KK prime nodes are quick. They go annihilate, leave the direct string behind. Gamma nodes annihilate, leave the red direct string behind. And then anomalous nodes annihilate. So everything is boring. Okay, so there is no charges, no, 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 nothing. And let me remind you, so here the eigenstates are real, which means that there is no Berry curvature. There is no churn number. So these band singularities, they don't have to be in high symmetry points. So that's why, like, if you look at the non-topological classification, they would tell you that there is nothing here. Okay, but if we just like look at these non-abelian charges, there is a topological charge coming through this braiding, and that this phase is nothing but boring because again, if I take this Dirac string, it's gonna it's gonna give me the edge state here in the in the anomalous gap. So now to convince you that this classification is really actually exhaustive, and then we are actually really looking at an out of equilibrium invariant. So let me go through this exercise. So so you, you might have noticed that like here, I'm just like showing an edge state only in the anomalous gap, not here, because the, like the, here the, like the presence of an edge state is given by like in comparison to the atomic limit. Since this is a Kagome lattice, there are already Dirac strings because the Vanier centers are shifted. There are already Dirac strings in the atomic limit in the first gap one and gap two. So that's why there is no difference when I look at the anomalous phase, but the green one doesn't exist, so that's why it reflects. But in principle, this, this quantity is generic, and then this is something I can quantify by looking at the, here I'm just like showing Kagome because it's convenient, but when I just like, let's say that I have zero Zak phases for each band in the atomic limit, I can induce some Dirac string along some direction, okay, along some um, lattice vector. So between band one and two, so there are some Dirac strings, so now they will have pi Zak phases along that, and there will be an edge state there. And then I can induce another one between these ones, now there will be an edge state if the this vector is finite, and then Zak phases are pi zero pi. So now here the trick is that if I just look at the Zak phases, and if I am at equilibrium, knowing the Zak phases is enough to give you the full bulk boundary correspondence. Because from this phase, you can come to this phase only through these changes here. And then you will know that I'm gonna have an edge state here and here, bulk edge correspondence is in impact. But if I am in a Floquet setting, there is another way from this configuration to this configuration, there's another way to arrive at that configuration. And that is through a band touching point between the anomalous gap. That would flip this one to pi, this one to pi directly, but that transformation would give me one edge state here only because I didn't touch here. So it means that this bulk edge correspondence is lost again, but you shouldn't be fooled because like here, these are the equilibrium invariants, but when we go to Floquet setting, we are in a three dimensional system, we need to do this thing in a gap specific way. So that's why when we look at, when we trace these band singularities, these invariants in a gap specific way, that's, and together, like we are tracing where are the band nodes, where are the Dirac string compared to the high equilibrium like classification atomic limit or high frequency limit. And then we are also looking at the Zak phases in common. That's why we know that this phases, this gives these invariants give a full classification. And then on top of here, if I do, for example, this phase, if I do one more transformation, they are flipped back to zero. And then I have edge states here. So again, you can have for the equilibrium invariants, you can have the same configuration, but here there is no edge states, there's full edge states. You need to do this thing in a gap specific way. That is the correct way of tracing the invariants, okay? So, and then again, they give the, they give the edge states. Uh, uh, and uh, so there are clear, clear signatures for this thing. So uh, now um, in, my, in, my, in my remaining time, I want to focus on a little bit more on the, these charges, these quaternion charges itself. Uh, so, but so here, so for example, when I have a band singularity, so here what I'm plotting is the, is the frame is the dry band. So these are the eigenstates, U1 and U2, and then U3 is out of the page. So I fix the gauge 
I start from somewhere. When I go around it, this frame is getting rotated. But when I complete a loop, the, before the Dirac string, it gets a pi minus minus sign. So this is this is the, how the frame is getting rotated. Okay. So and if this is the node in gap one, they are characterized by the quaternion charges i. In the adjacent gap, they are characterized by the quaternion charges j. In the other gap, k, vice versa. And and but for a given gap, they act as pi charges, plus minus pi charges. This is minus pi. This is plus pi, for example. But the, 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 the thing is that because like if you look at the, like you can also do an interferometry to a Dirac cone, right? If you just like complete a loop, like loop around it, you're going to pick up a pi fast. But getting these charges, since they correspond to plus minus pi, it's not possible with the conventional interferometry technique. Because like before braiding, they have plus minus one. How are you going to distinguish the sign? Or before braiding, they correspond to zero charge in total. After braiding, they are going to correspond to two pi. How are you going to distinguish the, these two pi charges? So uh, by cracking down on these singularities a, a little bit more, we could just like, uh, like develop two concrete methods to act, allow, allows us, uh, which allows us to access the, these charges directly, which also shines light on the natures of these, these drivings. So the, the idea is that if you start from some wave packet here, and then if you drive your wave packet in one of the bands, U1, for example, in band one, if you drive the wave packet through a band node, so this is a Dirac coin, I'm through, through, uh, driving the atoms through it. After I've passed the Dirac coin, I'm gonna be in a superposition of these bands and then this superposition. So remember that the third eigenstate is always out of the page. So, so, so it's, it's, it's orthonormal. So I'm gonna be a superposition of band one and two. I'm assuming also adiabatic evolution. And so this, uh, this overlap of after I exit this thing, it depends on how much this frame is rotated with respect to my uh, um, original incoming, incoming wave. And this is given by the rotation, frame rotation angle phi. Here, this is the interferometry angle. And when I do a complete loop, for example, if you change this theta, the frame gets rotated by pi, so it's half of it. And this is something, this pi angle, you can measure in the experiment. You, by measuring the sine square, for example, in the experiment, you can see that like this node has a pi charge. But now I'm after the, I'm after the, I'm after the sine of it, which is the hard thing uh, to, to access. So to do that, we need to probe two nodes at the same time. So I'm trying to come up with an idea that will give me the Z, B signs. So the way that like we achieve this thing is that imagine that from some starting point, equal distance away, so that I don't want to worry about the dynamic phases for now. So applying a pi half pulse, you can create an up and down superposition, okay? And then now I'm gonna apply some gradients, magnetic fields. So in experiments, these, these can be encoded by hyper, hyper fine states, for example. I'm gonna drive these atoms to the two nodes at the same time. Up atoms follow the path one, downs go through the path, path two. And then, uh, so when they cross these, these singularity here with some angle theta, they are gonna be in a superposition. C is cosine, cosine theta here that, that I show, and then Sign is, so let me fix the gauge for this one. So, so now let's analyze the node two. So with respect to, so if this node has the same frame winding, same frame rotation with this one, it means that this frame here rotates in the same way. Okay, it has the same chirality. But because the theta angle is minus now, if the charges are same, this sign is gonna be plus with respect to this one. If the charges are opposite, it's going to be minus, same thing. And then after that, these two beams, I, I combine them here after applying a pi half pulse. And then if you just like do this analysis, just like apply another pi half pulse to this thing, you will see that like if the nodes had the same charge, you have some cosine in U1, sine in U2, but up and down spins, both of them. So you're going to have a spin mixture, but if they had opposite charges, you will have only single spin species because the other ones interfered, interfered distractively. So by, by probing both of them at the same time and then by preparing a coherent superposition in the frame, which is automatically fixed by the Hamiltonian evolution, you can access these plus minus charges. And here, this is an example applied to the Kagome, Kagome lattice in the nearest neighbor, like I have KK prime nodes, 
you can just like start from here, drive up spins there, down spins there, combine here in like different like opposite charges. And then whenever they have opposite charges in these settings, I have only one spin species probability at the end. Whenever there is, they, they have uh, same charges, I'm gonna have a mixture. So I can directly read this thing. But, and on the way, for example, you can go through, so for example, with respect to this closing of the interferometry and that one, here this one crosses a Dirac string. And a Dirac string, remember, it just like puts a minus sign to my eigenstates. So it can change the probabilities between the different spin species, but you still have, you still, you're gonna still have a mixture. And this is something that like we can rigorously prove generally for generic configurations, because for any general bands here, for the Kagome lattice, it was special because it has C6 symmetry. So I only focused on the geometric phases there, but there are dynamic phases as well, which can complicate things. But when I have lattice symmetries, these two paths, they are gonna develop the same dynamic phases so they cancel each other. But also in the, for the general settings, so this can be countered by measuring the energies, for example, or we also propose the way of uh, extracting this information by doing a reference interferometry at double the acceleration, for example. But more interestingly, there can be any kind of Dirac strings that you crossed, you cross on, 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 on the road. So, and this is again something we can counter, for example, starting from here, up spins following that way, down spins following that way. If you cross a Dirac string, so these nodes are between bands N and N plus one, okay? So if you cross a Dirac string, you can, you know that what is the Dirac string puts a minus sign, so you get a pi phase here, okay? So any Dirac string you cross before you entering the nodes, because you're in a state just cause, like you're just in a U1 or UN up spins, for example. Any phase that any Dirac string you put here, it's just putting an e to power i pi phase here, but this is an overall phase. So this doesn't affect. So that's something that's okay, but any Dirac string after you cross this thing, it's gonna put, so now you have like cosine u1 minus sine u2, for example. If there is a Dirac string between one and two, it puts a minus sign in both of the eigenstates. If there is a Dirac string between one and zero, it puts a sign here or there. So this is something we can just like factoring all, all together and then how the evolution changes. And nicely that whenever we are just like here looking at the, the relative dynamic phase between different arms of the interferometry, arm one and arm two. So whenever this delta alpha and changes by pi, the relative sign changes. So whenever these two with respect to each other gets a minus sign. So here what I'm like considering here is that I can take this node and then move it as well. And this is what's measured by this, this Euler class non-abelian invariant, uh, although it's an ab abelian here, but so it's this non-abelian invariant, uh, Euler class. So, so, and they will, their signs will change as well. So this means that like this interferometry, this results that you get at the end, it directly tells you whether these nodes can combine or not, whether they can annihilate or not. So it, it gives you the obstructions against annihilation. So it's a direct way of accessing this invariant as well. So in the, in, in the last, last, last minute, so let me just like show you another way of doing it. So this is again a, interferometric way of looking at things, but there is no closed loop, uh, but it has its advantages. So now you can imagine that you have only a single wave packet, single atoms, and then you are, you want to experience the, the different nodes, different frame charges consecutively. So you start from band N, enter one node, exit with some angle. So any dynamic phase you collect here is not gonna change anything, it's an overall phase. But here in between the nodes, there is a dynamic phase that you're gonna pick up. And this is gonna give how this cosine sign changes with respect to each other. And then imagine that we enter a second node and exit again. So now this is a more complicated situation because I have this dynamic phase there, but by playing with these probabilities a little bit, we can write that this final population in the band I started, I can say that like this, 
this is an oscilla oscillation, uh, oscillates with respect to this first angle in the first node, with some amplitude and phase that are given by the second angle that, like, that, that I swap. And uh, so the, the problem is that this, this phase shift here, uh, it also depends on this theta 2. I'm just finishing. Uh, but this is something I can extract again by doing it the double acceleration. I can get this guy's, this guy's sign, and then I can just like apply how this, this, this changes with beta. The thing is that if the nodes have same charges, here this is exactly like numerical data, these oscillations will shift rightwards, and then if they have opposite charges, these oscillations shift leftward to the blue thing. So by looking at this shift, you can again tell, yeah. Uh, they are half of them. So theta is the interferometry angle, which angle I entered and exit, and then phi is the frame rotation angle. So, and then the frame rotation angle is half of it, if, if the Hamiltonian is removed. So it's just, it's just a difference of about half. So by looking at where my oscillations are shifting, and this is something this can be just like easily accessed in the experiments, this is just populations in a band. All that in my experiments, for example. So by looking at the shift, we can just like tell what are the charges, whether they're same or opposite. So with this, let me leave you with my summary slide. So there are these interesting topologies that has been like the first prediction is just like three years ago or something, three, now it's four maybe. So, um, so but when we go to the, uh, the uh, uh, periodic deriving, we can do anomalous braiding, just like go to phases that we can only arrive at like by braiding out of equilibrium and then by uh, by doing this this braiding and then these charges they also they also we also know how they physically manifest itself in this in this coherent superpositions and then their interference resistance. Thank, Thank you. Questions? Um, so with the interferometry um, thing you were describing, like how do you, you propose to have these like states travel along these like paths in the blue one zone? So that's um, <clears throat> uh, so th this is something that's already within the like that part has been already established in in experiments. So there is so so one thing is that so here we employed up and down spins for this this one for example. So you need a you need a lattice acceleration. So these are neutral atoms. So the way that like this has been done in experiments is that you have some optical lattice, you shift it. So you just like prepare the atoms initially somewhere, and then like to prepare this up and down mixture, you can just like start with some hyperfine states and then apply a pi half pulse. So you have a mixture, okay? And then by doing some some gradient, applying some magnetic field. To, to, to these states, for example, or just like by doing lattice acceleration, so you can just you just need to guide them towards some nodes. So this mixture and then separating these atoms, it has been already established by Ulrich Schneider and uh, Immanuel Bloch, but they were targeting a single Dirac cone. They were just like guiding the the atoms around it. So uh, what I'm saying is that path precision and then guiding these atoms are already within the reach. Okay. And then, so now we want to go directly head on to the Dirac cones. Again, this is just shifting the, shifting the beams a little bit. And then this is also some capability that uh, like bench temperature has, for example. Uh, yeah. Um, but does the, uh, the like selectivity of like where the, which path you're controlling depend on like the spin state? Exactly. Of Exactly. But so once you go through the, the singularity, doesn't the spin state change? Like you become so this that's admixture. something exactly. So initially, I want to guide them like that, right? Like let's say that up and down, I want to guide them like this. So I want to apply some gradient along that direction, but I also want them to deflect. So let's say that I do this thing, and then afterwards I want to close the interferometry. That is something if I do, you can do by just flipping the spins, for example. Then or under the same same conditions, now they are gonna converge into each other. So that's a way of doing it. For example, yeah. okay. Any further question? I have a question. Okay. Uh, in order to realize uh, your Floca phases in experiment, okay. you one can use, for example, ultra cold atoms. Yes. But then, 
uh, where you have some, let's say, optical lattice potential, and this optical lattice potential has uh, many bands. Yes. And of course, there could be gaps between the bands, and in a static situation, that's fine, but when you turn on uh, periodic driving, actually, these all bands fall down to the, the same Floquet zone. Yes. So you never have, let's say, such, uh, let's say, separated bands with gaps. You mean you mean like like p bands are gonna yes, come down, but not exactly. only p bands, but also other. Yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So I mean, this is something that like we usually rely on separation of scales. So it would require some tuning of the frequency exactly with respect to the bands. But so for example, if if we if we have just in in the example of a honeycomb lattice, when I have just two bands, so this and not the multi-gap frequency, not the multi-gap uh, topology, but others, like when I just like drive it, if I just like choose my driving frequency, like small still with respect to the, to the other bands, I can just like rely on that, like those are not gonna come down too much. And this is how experimentally it could be measured in Munich, for example, these like uh, that there's a single band touching point in the anomalous gap when I have two bands. Case, for finite time that it is approximation exactly exactly but that was that that those when we just like analyze those time scales they 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 seem to be enough that like we just like do that thing so now for kagome setting we just like want to do that but but this question is nice uh, interesting because like p bands sometimes like of course i'm not gonna think about that like oh i'm bringing down all all the bands there but p bands could be also a resource because I want to have multiple bands. So for example, in just in the honeycomb lattice, by now instead using the P bands and then by doing the band touching points between that, we can also imagine braidings there. So they could be also resource in principle, but for some finite times, of course, yeah. Okay, thank you. Any questions? If not, so let's uh, thanks Noor again. Okay, thank you.